as a play. This is Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. This is Mark Wade, writer of Superman Birthright. And you're listening to The Krypton Report. And you're listening to Krypton Report. Kryptonian podcast, including Superman and Supergirl. We discuss games, movies, cartoons, TV shows, and comics. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Welcome to the Krypton Report. This is a fun episode, isn't it, James? You know why this is a fun episode? Because this is actually the second time we're recording this episode. Because the first time we were almost done with it, and we had technical problems, and we lost it all. So now we are back trying to bring you that same awesome energy that we had last time that you've come to love from James and I talking late at night, but pair, pairing that with some new information that we have and actually doing it a little bit earlier in the day. I so. think we, I think we did. <clears throat> excuse me. My voice cracked. I think we did pretty good. Um, <laughs> that, that night when we were recording, I know I told you, I was like, it was so good. We had so much fun with banter. We sounded like awesome professionals. And now we're just having to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> can't capture the magic again. No, you can't. So what we're going to try, um, we're going to try to say some things. So we're just going to jump on in and uh, we're going to dive into some news. And here we go. Ready? <gasps> so in December, Pennyworth season two returns uh, December 13th, I believe. And they're going to I believe that's right. So. And they're going to air. Up until right around Christmas, they're going to have a two-part mid-season finale, then pick back up in January. So that's cool. Um, you know, the DC property that everyone forgot about exists. Because um, it's not like on anything. Yeah, it's only on Epics. Like, it's uh, it's in that small thing that we discussed of properties that are still pretty much tied elsewhere. Uh, you know, mainly they're Batman properties in Smallville. Yeah. I haven't finished the first season. I watched from what I saw of the first season, few, first few episodes. Um, I really enjoyed. Um, I haven't gotten back to finish it because it's well, it's only on Epics, and I don't have Epics. I'd have to set up a time to do the trial and just binge the whole thing. So you could do that now. See, when I did it, I had to be crafty and clever. I had to use multiple emails and multiple cards. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> like, like I had to be sneaky, sneaky. <laughs> Sound, sounds like too sounds like too much energy to watch a show. Uh, but you know I like the podcast with Phil, and I was enjoying watching it, so I uh, did it because it was right there at the time when uh, my company was switching over and Epics was no longer being covered. So, mm. and I was like, no, of course you would take this away from us right now, right when there's finally something on Epics worth watching. Not that Epix doesn't have programming that's worth watching. Uh, I also watched a really cool documentary on punk music, pretty much hosted by E Pop. So that was pretty awesome. Mm. Okay, so Pennyworth, check. All right, moving on. Bat Wheels, a nice new animated preschooler styled TV series. Preschool. Yeah, and uh, you know. Preschool people. <laughs> I have. Uh, it basically looks like Cars with the Batmobile, and probably like the Robin cycle. Um, and Maybe the bat plane and the bat boat. And yeah, they're all best pals, you know, yeah. hanging out down the street, you know, uh, doing some, you know, cool uh, <laughs> things. So Teen Titans go to the movies. Called it, man. <laughs> Batmobile's getting his own movie. Coming broom. <laughs> Um, so that's cool. I have, you know, that's, that's perfect for my kid's age. You know, I showed them the picture of the Batmobile that was released and they both were like, oh, that looks cool. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'll watch it. And I would watch it without them just because I would, uh, see what it's like. You know why? Because I'm that dang cool. I'm right there with you. I'm going to check it out. Um, let's see. So, yep. Checking that out. All right, bat wheels check. Um, so James has a very awesome DC online character photo. He showed us. So I posted it on the socials. I was like, yes, I need. I want to play DC Universe Online just to make my own. It'll be an overweight middle-aged man from Krypton. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
who, uh, when he came to Earth, somehow uh, did not get awesome powers. He's just cool. And uh, <laughs> he's just cool. Yeah, I mean. Uh, well, you you are pretty cool, Tyler. I try, you know. I mean, I often used to joke that I'm like the story of Superman, except instead of getting uh, more powerful when I arrived, I just became uh, <clears throat> weaker in the uh, yellow sun. So it's like the exact opposite, but the same story, you know. And uh, <laughs> so, nice, you know. I, 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 some people find it amusing. Some people find my, you know, humor not funny. Uh, my mom, but whatever, you know, it's cool. Um, so anyways, that's another thing. Just like, you know, some people think it's funny when I have to like complain about, you know, how I still don't understand why I spent so much time in high school learning about finding the slope of a line in calculus and I can't do my own taxes. So, you know, I just think that there is a, things for all of us that we should work on. Yeah. Some things click, some things don't. Yep, and finding that slope is awesome. All right, keep moving on. What else we got here? We're just cranking it out. I'm so going I guess, through the news. <laughs> I guess. Um, so they're making, like, little shorts of some sort to go along with the death metal soundtrack that's being created. And I guess in one of the shorts... Um, David Hasselhoff is going to voice Superman for the death metal Superman. Hmm. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. I mean, he is, he is, what, what is he, what is he being like being overwhelmed by, by dark matter crisis energy or something? All I know is that I read, um, I read, uh, I read part four. I have not read four yet. And I just forgot what part three had in it. <laughs> it sounds horrible, I know, but I'm just like, I feel like this story is so big, and I have not read the tie-ins. I'm like, I gotta read the tie-ins or something. I just feel like it's just so much. I like, like I've liked the tie-ins. Like, Trinity Crisis was really good, um, because, uh, well, the idea in Trinity Crisis was they are going to the dark matter uh uni um dark matter universe am i saying that right <laughs> they they're, they're going to the the dark uh multiverse i said dark matter dark multiverse um to go to the worlds that are basically um living these crises over and over and over again um perpetually to supply perpetua with multiversal energy and they're going there to try and collect that energy for themselves in Trinity Crisis. And then, you know, I don't want to spoil it, so you'll have to read it. Um, and then uh, Speed Metal was pretty cool, getting to um, spend the entire issue with Barry and Wally and Jay Garrick and uh, Wallace West. And um, Is that what they're calling uh, the New 52 Wally as Wallace? I think so. I'm a little behind on my flash reading, and like I, I watched a really awesome um, video. Uh, basically, basically, like it's funny because they were talking to do the history of the Flash, and they're like, "There are two Wally Wests." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there are." Um, and then he, uh, uh, and and there. Yeah, so that one was spent with the Flash family, and then uh, Multiverses End. Uh, Multiverses End was pretty cool because, um, like, John Stewart was taken down by Owl Man, and then John Stewart had to play exposition guy and tell Owl Man all about like what he knew about what was going on, and um, give Owl Man information on previous iterations of the multiverse and previous iterations of himself from, from before other crises. And they had like green lanterns and they had owl man and they had bat baby and they had captain carrot and a whole bunch of stuff. So, and in that point there was only like six, six universes left in existence. Um, I feel like, you know, there was this time and period when DC, like, 
didn't have a crisis every three years. Now they're like, we have to build up to a new crisis. And it's just like, it is. I highly recommend these videos. Well, what's interesting about death metal here is it's it's like described as like the anti-crisis crisis. Yeah. Like the reason all of the crises happened before, like that's that's actually partially explained in Multiverses Ended, where uh, I think it was oh what what caused something caused the first crack in the source wall, and that allowed Perpetua to reach out and twist the anti-monitor for him to do crisis on infinite earths. And then the crack grew larger and she was able to reach farther to get like what Superboy prime to like start infinite crisis or, and then, and then something else for like, um, she influenced final crisis, which I think, you know is what I mean? like, which is all great. I just, I feel like it just should be metal should be a little bit more like it feels so crazy radical. But yet, I feel like I should be more upfront and part of everything, and not being as much of like in the background, like oh, metal's going on over here. It's yeah, it's kind of like I said, it's kind of hard to see like how is metal going, like, and how are all of these other books going? Like, is metal still in the future, and all of these stories are exist in the past, like before, right. because of the way. Snyder's last issue of Justice League ended and then it went into death metal. So the the continuity is is you know in flux, but that's also part of what's going on here is is uh um is somebody was explaining it on another podcast and then what I was reading about future state um which is going to be what happens after death metal. So metal is cool though. I mean, I like I like Scott Snyder's writing and just I don't know. I've not been a huge fan of like the Batman Who Laughs. Like it works, but I feel like it's gotten so big and it's such a mouthful to say. Like the Batman Who Laughs. Like it's a, his, his name well, is now, a, literally a sentence. Well, now he's just the Darkest Knight. Or they, what do they call him at once? He who laughs or something. Um, they call they called him Batman Hatton. <laughs> so. Uh, but yeah, I feel like metal ties into everything else. But yet, they're kind of, in a way, it's like being treated as like this side uh, adventure. So, well, the interesting thing, I guess, is the way that metal is going to wrap up um, what it's going to do to the fabric of space and time and reality is what future state is based off of. Oh, and which look is at that segue. Two... Look at that segue. My man James, <laughs> right here. James, take us to the future, bro. Now. <laughs> well, future down. state is going to be January and February of 2021. And it's like brand wide. Like every single book is going to stop. And every single book that comes out is going to be future state. And it's all how space and time is in flux after death metal. And I mean, we got a glimpse at it in Joker Warzone, where Batman got trapped in some kind of temporal thing, and he literally reverted back to his first iteration with the wide ears and the purple gloves and stuff. Um, and Commandy uh, came out of a portal or or a wormhole or something um, to get him, and that's kind of like, and that's like the first thing we have for uh, future state, but there's going to be different stories. We're going to get different versions. Like we're going to get the Luke Fox version of Batman. We're going to get the, the Superman, the John Kent version of Superman. Um, we're going to get a South American um, wonder woman. Um, I just saw her name today, but I cannot for the life of me, remember what it was. It was a lot to um, take in trying to read that. Like, Oh, it was, it, it was a release. big, it was, yeah, it was a thick article, uh, a lot of books. Everything that comes out in January and February is all going to be future state. Which is kind of cool. And you know, and then March is going to pick up the regular back to the regular <clears throat> processed uh system. Yeah. Yeah, the numbers, the numbering of the issues is going to be intact, but I think the I think the their idea is, you know, 
after metal and then after future state, I mean, who knows what they've got planned, but maybe things are a little more settled when it comes to this huge cosmic threat for the time being anyways, of course. But who knows? So it's going to be interesting. I'm probably going to read the Superman with, with John just because I like John Kent. Um, In the article, it was very interesting because they said something about how John Kent to protect Metropolis shrinks Metropolis and bottles Metropolis. Yeah. And it puts him at odds with Supergirl. Did you see the cover art for it? I posted it on our social as soon as I saw it. Um, I'll see if I can send it over to you now. I was going to say, I haven't been on uh, socials too much. Let me yeah, see here. I don't get on a whole lot. Oh, wow. That cover actually looks really good, though. He, the, the way they're drawing him reminds me a lot of, like, the way Superman kind of... Well, the um, in the article, they have a picture. They have... Uh, uh, it looks, I don't know, maybe like an ad type thing or whatever for Future State, and it's got so many different characters. And I really like the way John is looking and his suit and everything. John is a much leaner character than than Clark was. Than Clark was. Yeah, he, he reminded me of like uh, Flashpoint Superman, but not as like lanky, you know. Yeah, and um, uh, the um. In in deceased um, number four, have you read that yet? No, I'm not even read, reading deceased. I, oh, you're just, not reading deceased. No, nah, I just um, it was one of those I had to make a call. Like, okay, Tyler, you have to you have to take a break on something. Right. I'm not filled. so. Well, yeah, I've, I've been I've, I've been following more. deceased. Um, I mean, I, I Tom you, Taylor James. is one of my favorites. So that's why I have you. James. I've definitely <laughs> right. Well, in deceased number four, they go to New Genesis. Um, because they need to try and contact um, um, Mobius. Uh, they need the chair. Um, and uh, Orion is mad at Mr. Miracle for things that have gone down. And he decks him. He hits him. And he tells him to get up. And he knocks him down again. And he tells him to get up. And he knocks him down again. And Superboy tells him, well, not Superboy, he's Superman. Um, Superman tells him to stop, to quit. And Orion won't listen to him. So next time Mr. Miracle gets up, before Orion can hit him, Superman comes in and hits Orion. And there's a there's a, a thought bubble in there or, or a, a narr- narration box. And I think, it, I think it's Damien speculating how Superboy, Superman, John Kent's um, unique biology being human and Kryptonian would um, speculates that maybe that w- that combination makes him more powerful than Clark ever was. And he laid out Orion with one punch. Yes. Laid him out cold. <laughs> See, this future state is basically like a restructure of the 5G is what it feels like. Yeah, I think that's what it is. And 5G was a horrible name. I'm just going to say there. Didio. Didio. <laughs> Didio. Whatever the name you were chosen. <laughs> Dido. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's, that's what's going on with the comics. Now, keep on moving around. Okay, so let's jump to... We got some behind-the-scenes set photos from The Batman... Basically, it's a it's just photos on the steps of a building, and we see the penguin, Selena Kyle. I want to clarify, it's Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne. And Pattinson's Bruce Wayne looks like, eh, yeah, okay. Um, but Selena Kyle looks cool. And dear Lord, that makeup on Colin Farrell, like. It's 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 unbelievable. That's him. He looks like a completely different person, but from that set photo, from one of those set photos, the way he's like wide eyed and looking at somebody, uh-huh. you can see it in his eyes. Like yes. that's definitely Colin Farrell. You can tell. You've seen that look in his eyes uh, in in other uh, 
in other roles he's played, but he looks like a completely different person with that makeup on. I mean, so that is definitely Colin Farrell. That's Oscar worthy makeup right there. Mm-hmm. And I'm excited. Like I like Colin Farrell. So um this is very interesting. And then the only other like big like the Selena Kyle looks cool, but they're all behind the scenes set photos. She's just wearing like black trench coat with a hat. It's kind of cat like on the side with boots. So um the only other thing was I saw um was a behind the scene that looked more of the stunt man doing like motorcycle stunts or something in the bat suit and it looked like he had a gun on his side and people were like Batman has a gun Batman has a gun and I'm just like you know what at this point guys come on like this is all behind the scenes it's the stunt performer and you did you see how big the barrel on that gun was because you could see it through a hole in the holster on his hip did you see how big the end of the barrel of that gun was? It looked quite large. That's a, that looks like it's I, – I think that's going to be the grapple, like a grapple gun or something. I mean, it could very well be. I mean, let's not forget um, um, that, you know, Batflick had a rifle that he shot a dart on straight out of Frank Miller's you know, book where Batman's holding a gun. You know, yeah, he uses a rifle and he shoots a grappling line across buildings uh, or or a tightrope across buildings with a rifle because he needed something powerful to be able to do that. So, I mean, and once again, like with the costume photos that came out, he is a stunt performer. A lot of times stunt costumes are made differently for different shots because they're performing a stunt. Yeah. All right. That type of stuff's fixed in post, changed in post. Next thing, moving on. HBO Max revealed that they're going to have a Green Lantern series. And it was more news, and we learned that it's going to focus on not Jon Stewart and not Hal Jordan. But we know Guy Gardner. We know Simon Bass, Jessica Cruz. And we're unsure about Kyle. That was the one that we debated on. Like, we weren't sure if it, was, if it mentioned Kyle or not. I've heard kind of both ways, uh, but we knew for sure it wasn't John and Hal, because as we speculated, we don't know what's going on with the Snyderverse, because, you know, Hal was supposed to be in Justice League, and then we have our threads about John Diggle, John Stewart, floating around, so, you know, what can that be? And And I've said before, like, I think Jessica Cruz has a very interesting story as the Green Lantern, and it would be a great... I would like to see her in Justice League just for the sheer fact of bringing another woman into the Justice League. Uh, also an eth ethnical character who has an amazing backstory, first of all. Um, so, why not, you know? Yeah. I mean, her 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 character backstory of how her friends were killed on camping trip. She escaped and she's been in, she's lived in fear and hiding, hiding out the whole time and stuff like that. And then the fact that her ring comes from power ring from earth three. Um, and, and the fact that it's like, there's an entity like inside that's, that's what's like, that's what like twisted and caused the fear inside of um, power ring from the crime syndicate. Um, and I mean, that would be a very cool thing to explore just how the, um, the ring tries to manipulate her or, or influence her in different ways because of the being inside, but just something that, you know, would be unique to her character, her stories, um, and not even necessarily yet have to reach back to, you know, earth three and the crime syndicate. Like, you know, like it would be something that you could set up little bits here and there about what's going on, about her action, about why is Jessica doing this? Like, what is going on? And, you know, little dialogue pieces where it's just enough that if they need you or want to explore it later on down the line, they can. But if they don't, then... um. You know, it's not no loss. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, the character was named Volthoom, and then I know that there's some other – there's other entities inside of the power battery and things like that. Um, so, I mean, if they decided not to go the Earth-3 route, they could still use that, you know, these these entities in the power battery or something are – reaching through her ring and trying to influence her and manipulate her due to her past experiences being unique to herself or something like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, but it's really cool. They're going to have, they're going to have a female. Um, she, she's Latin American. Uh, they're going to have guy Gardner. They're going to have a Muslim, um, character, Simon Baz, and he's from Dearborn, Michigan. So he's, he's pretty close He's pretty close to me or his, from where he's from. Because that's where Jeff Johns is from. Oh, really? Michigan, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I knew he was from Michigan. I didn't know it was like Dearborn, Michigan. I I, um, I, I want to say, but I could be wrong. He could, Or he could be straight from Detroit. I don't remember. But, you know, it's Jeff Johns, so he's going to kind of bring it home. And, um, and then uh, Alan Scott, they seem to be referencing his – New 52 iteration from his Earth 2 counterpart or his Earth 2 character, as it were, because, uh, you know, in New 52, it changed up a little bit. Um, but Alan Scott is gay as well. That's the one I forgot was they were actually going to bring uh, Alan Scott into it. Yeah, those were the four main ones. Guy Gardner, Alan Scott, Jessica Cruz, and Simon Baz. Those are the four main ones that they're going to be focusing on. But um, let me say, Kyle was the one we weren't sure about. Um, yeah. Maybe they'll bring him as special, like White Lantern or something. Yeah, well, that's his, that's his biggest thing is, is he's the torchbearer. After Hal decimated the core, he was the one who kept the core alive. Like, he wasn't, like, the biggest core member, but he was the one who kept the core alive. Yeah, and he's the one who gets all people forget. He's like the Tim Drake of the Green Lanterns. Comic <laughs> fans know him, but people don't know him. But, all right, so the last thing, news-wise, was, once again, DC, Warner Brothers, has rearranged the film slate. I won't even divulge into what dates or what, because you know they're going to change again, probably. But um, the Batman was the big one, kind of, for me, just because it was going to be, you know, October, Halloween, Batman, Genia's birthday. And now it is spring, March of 2021, which is crazy to think about because when that movie comes out in, like, two years. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we still have a long time now. Like, because I'm thinking about March of 20. 21, right? Or no, 2022. My bad. Yeah. Because I'm thinking Solomon will turn seven. So he will be eight when that movie comes out. Holy moly. No, wait, he'll be seven. Oh my God, I cannot think. He will be seven. He is five right now. He will be seven because his birthday is in January. So, and I'm just like. I mean, that means he'll be old enough that I'll be able to probably take him with me because he's a cool kid and a mature kid and watches everything else almost with me. Um, you know, so not to worry about that. But, you know, the idea is, holy crap, like, you know, that's two years. You know, we were waiting, you know, October of next year. And it's like, oh, a year. All right. Now it's, yeah. like, now it's like now it's a year and a half. And you're just like, oh, man, like, it's going to happen. But at the same time, it's like, when I look at things through the eyes of, like, my children, I'm just like, holy crap. <laughs> right. Or when you measure time by how old your children are going to be. Like I told oh, you my before, goodness. Like I told you before, Man of Steel came out. And by the time BVS came out, and we followed that so tightly. We, we moved to North Carolina. Moved back, got pregnant, had Solomon, and he was a year old, and the movie came out. Well, dude, uh, Smallville was still on TV when Jimmy was born. I had just bought season seven when it came out on DVD. Iron Man had just come out that year, and I bought that on DVD. And same thing with The Dark Knight had come out, and I bought that on DVD. All those things came out when 
And I and I had just bought those when my son was born. And now, 23 movies later, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe has, like, wrapped up its major... <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. It's um, crazy, the passage of time. So... Um, but, yeah, I'm not... Like, I'm not holding my breath, because right now they, they have, like... The slate said two unnamed Warner Brothers films, and then they don't even have uh, really when um, Black Adam is going to come out. So, well, I mean that even that even attach it that could even be like Warner Brothers films like Fantastic Beast three too. You that's, know, that's that what I put on hold too. That's what I mentioned to a friend due to all mind. this. Because that's another big tentpole franchise that's kind of not been talked about and kind of was like, oh, yeah, that's coming out. But so that's all caught up on all the news that was added in the time between a couple of days from when we talked last when we was trying to record this episode. But now we're going to get back into comics and talk about John Burns' Man of Steel number two. And the quick summary of this one is I like this issue. Compared to how I, I talked about last issue, I like this one. Yeah. So, it was, this one focused on um, Lois Lane. And it was really nice to see the way they did it with Lois Lane. So, you, you can take it away, James. Um, hold on, let me... Let me... Switch over here to my Man of Steel. There we go. Um, I mean, yeah this this whole this whole book. I mean, it does. It just takes place over a shorter period of time, um, like a week, handful of days, or whatever. Whereas you know, the first issue took place over the first twenty five years of Clark's life. Um, but uh, no, it starts off. He swoops by. Perry and Lois on the street and she's trying to like follow Superman to, to get an interview with him. Um, they introduce Lex here. Lex's driver tries to get Lois to, uh, get in the car, but she basically decide you know, says that Superman's more important and, uh, uh, that should, that Lex will have to catch her later. And the driver says that he's going to South America and he won't be back for at least a year. So she says much later. So she's very, she has very little concern for Lex at the moment. She probably doesn't feel good to Lex, of course. Um, he probably takes that hugely personally. Of course. <laughs> um, so she, she gets the, the news helicopter, um, to fly her around, um, a woman, uh, totally 80s, the clothes she's wearing and walking down the street with a boombox uh, on her shoulder. Uh, she gets mugged, and Superman stops the guy who mugged her. I love this part. I mean, for the most part. <laughs> and uh, it's funny because the next page, you see the guy try to turn around and run, and Superman's just on the other side of him. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, he returns. He returns the purse to the lady, and uh, he returns the purse to the lady who got mugged. Uh, he hangs the guy up in uh, on a lamp post in a garbage can, so that way he is stuck until the police arrive. And he even turns down the lady's. Uh, uh, radio. He says, uh, and I think the radio is a trifle loud, don't you? After all, in a city this size, consideration for others is the only thing that keeps life bearable. And he heads off. Um, uh, the reason he was in such a hurry is because over her radio, he hears a uh, uh, police have surrounded Clancy's liquor store uh, that it's being held up by gunmen. Uh, the this this part out. is cool, like because it's still Superman, you know, introducing himself basically 
to the world and to Metropolis. And, you know, everyone's trying to figure out who this Superman is. Like, what, what's, what's his angle? What's his endgame? You know? This will be the biggest interview since God spoke to Moses. <laughs> That's my favorite line from Perry White. Uh, it's just one of those things that just hits you in the right place, makes you chuckle, you know? Right. Um, so the SWAT team is outside of the liquor store, and the uh, the commander, um, the captain, uh, is is calling to the gunman, uh, telling him to release the hostages. Uh, and he was hoping, he says he was, I was kind of hoping my reputation would be enough to scare them out of there. And the guy says, guess it's not, uh, guess not skipper. It looks like we'll really have to go in after him, but, uh, there are bound to be civilian, civilian casualties. And that's when Superman shows up. Maybe not. Let me help. And they're like, who, huh, huh, who are you? Yeah. And they, they make fun of his clothing. They say, he, what circus did he come from? Um, he, Superman. He's like, he's like, Haley's my back away. Yeah, right. Uh, Superman says, just do as I ask, please, Captain. Believe me, it will make your life much easier. Uh, he's walking up towards the guy, uh, the, the guy who's holding a hostage. And he's telling him to stop um, one more step and he's going to shoot him. And it's funny. Superman says, what are you afraid of? You don't think I'm hiding any weapons in this outfit, do you? Just like I'm wearing this to the skin tight, the skin tight outfit here. I'm, I'm obviously not hiding anything. And he pinches the barrel shut on the gun. And then we have my. My second, like, well, I guess maybe my first favorite line in this one, where she's like, the other lady uh, turns to him and is like, what the? And waste the mother. <laughs> like, it's just, it's just, it cracks me up. Waste the mother. It's not, yeah. even, it's not even like Sam Jackson. <laughs> um, I was going to say, if it was Sam Jackson, it would have been full on. <laughs> Face this, or my other favorite version of that word um, is that makes me laugh is uh, Morgan Freeman in Wanted when he's like shoot this mother in the head <laughs> like it just sounded funny <laughs> coming from Morgan Freeman at that time you know where everyone joked about him being the voice of God so it's kind of funny like shoot this mother in the head right <laughs> <laughs> yeah it definitely sounds different coming from Morgan Freeman than it does from uh, Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> uh, so they start shooting at Superman. Bullets are bouncing off, and he uses his heat vision to uh, make it so they can't hold on to their guns. And he says, and now for a couple of my softest taps, and you creeps should be in dreamland for about an hour. Like, he just he just taps them, sends them flying, and catches them at the same, you know, all in the same instant. Which is awesome. It's another example of, like, just how fast he can move. Um, so like my favorite part in Smallville where Clark throws the football, runs, knocks the bag out, saves Chloe, runs back to get tackled. Yeah. Um, like he was always like, yeah, in Smallville, like he's a blur and stuff like that. But there's a point where he gets so fast, like you can't even register his movement. The blur. <laughs> yeah, the blur. <laughs> the, the, oh, um, there he is. Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so Superman's going to the lady. You wouldn't hit a lady, would you? And a lady, no, I'd never hit a lady. And he like flicks her. He's like, I would never hit a lady, but you, ma'am, are no lady. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then I've never met a lady who carries dynamite under her coat. So he just got himself close to her so he could get dynamite out from under her coat and disarm it. Um, and Lois, she gets to the liquor store and she turns up too late. Uh, he just took off a few seconds ago. And then the next page here, she's following him to all these different things, a uh, 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 fire, um, probably like a jewelry robbery or something like that, a train 
uh, stopping a, a subway train from hitting somebody who probably fell on the tracks um, and stopping some people from robbing uh, an armored truck. And it says, sorry, Miss Lane, he was here, but you just missed him. Which I love because it's spread out over the multiple uh, pages. Yeah, the multiple panels with of the multiple incidents where she just keeps hearing the same thing. <laughs> So I, I like that. And she has a little interaction with Jimmy here, how people are getting these stories about Superman doing this. Obviously no interviews with Superman or anything, but people writing stories um, about what Superman has done. And Lois takes it upon herself here to drive her car into the bay. This is a very nice uh, thing to, to do. Yeah, to literally draw Superman to her when she could possibly die. Um, so her car is sinking, and Superman dives in after her and pulls her car out of the out of the water, and he flies her back to uh, her apartment. <laughs> Gets ready to leave, and she screams, come back here. And he says, yes, and he's right there. You leave him. Uh, he's sitting in her apartment. She brings him some, uh, she brings him some wine, brings him some brie. Um, and they have a, a short interview. Um, she's asking him some questions. Uh, which is great because like, she's trying to ask him questions and he's being in a sense, very vague in a way about his answers. Uh, he's not getting to like the meat that she wants because we'll figure out why shortly. Um, but we get a nice um, exit of Superman and he asks her about the iron lung that she had. And Lois has an epiphany that he knew the whole time that yeah. she was faking. So. Well, because he says, uh, I guess I'd have to say out of town, Lois. To be honest, I don't really know exactly where I'm from. I guess it really doesn't matter. Um, what matters is that I think and feel as an American. Uh, yeah. And then, and then, uh, he does ask her if she, if she always drives around with an aqua lung under her front seat. So it's, it's really nice there. Uh, it's, it's a really good interaction. And then, uh, uh, Superman flies to the daily planet for an appointment he has with Perry White. And he shows up, obviously, as Clark Kent. <laughs> so keep my, but uh, not just now. Right now, it's time for me to keep my appointment with Perry White. The appointment I made two days ago is Clark Kent. Like, because, yeah, we think he's going to show up to an interview as Superman, I guess, is what John Byrne is thinking. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's interesting just because of the fact that we, we were mentioning, like, you have Clark writing about himself. And, you know, the ethics of that. Um, and we pointed out how, you know, recently we saw where Clark kind of wrote about himself, but he wrote about, like, the street level part of the event because he was there on the street. And it's kind of this conundrum of, is it ethical? And I always, you know, I like how it was done, like, in Lois and Clark, where, you know, he, Lois rejected a story that Perry wanted. And she said it was basically beneath her, and Clark took it, and that's how he got his, uh, his you know, job. Yeah, yeah, and that in that he took the initiative to, um, uh, uh, to to take a story and write it very well, and that's how he got himself a job. Um, in this, he get he writes a story about Superman, like like he got an interview with Superman. Um, which Lois comes in and she says that she has the interview and Perry's already got it and he already ran it. <laughs> um, that's why I says, you know, back to Superman's actual interview from earlier where he's being very vague to her on purpose. Right. And he's kind of like, um, he's kind of like this, this is definitely, I think a little bit more of a way of a cockier, um, Superman. Yeah, with, with the way he, I, you you could see like you could see that being like Dean Cain's version of Superman, the yeah. way he was. 
Um, so, and we talked about, you know, Dean Cain, him being Superman is the first post-crisis live action Superman. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've talked about, we talked about how, how, um, like, yeah, it's, it's possibly, it's, it's probably unethical for him to write the story about himself. Um, it got his foot in the door, but as Clark, he tends to, um, write, write pieces about, like, like we said, like you said, like the ground level stuff. Um, you know, he, he, does, he, Lois takes the Superman bylines where he takes the bylines of, you know, the victims and the witnesses and things like that. Mm-hmm. The common man. Because, yeah. You know, like there's been a lot of stories where they focused on the idea that, you know, Clark Kent as a reporter is very important to Superman because it's something that he's doing basically without his powers. You know, it's something that he is doing kind of like his brain. It separates him from Superman and it's way of him doing something without it always being about, oh, look at me. I'm Superman. Yeah. Which, which we, we know, you know, we all know Clark, he needs, he needs to be grounded. He needs time as Clark. He, he can't always be Superman. And I mean, that's the same thing when it comes to his job, you know? He, he has to, he does what he can as, as a regular, uh, as a regular guy trying to be a regular reporter, writing regular stories, and you know, not, not low, not like Lois always chasing the Pulitzer. Yeah. And I, I always liked the idea that Clark excelled at things, but he was never like, Hey, look at me. You know, he always kind of tried to keep it just a little bit under. So that was number two. I really enjoyed number two. Uh, yeah, number the nine three panel grid. Cool um, three, like we see the gargoyle, uh, and it pans down from the, the rooftop. Like you don't see Batman on the gargoyle, Batman. but it's the and gargoyle, and like cool. closer, and then like down the rooftop, and then down into the alley, and then you see the guy running, um, and Batman swoops in and starts attacking him. Um, Batman here, he's been chasing him. And he, you know, Batman, he doesn't have time to deal with anybody. He wants answers and he wants them now. He's, you know, I don't have, you know how I hate having my time wasted. Um, you know, he's trying to get answers from this guy. His name's Bull, of course. Yeah, right? it, that this was guy, funny. This huge, yeah, this huge guy named Bull who looks like he's got cauliflower ear. Like, of course, <laughs> his name's Bull. Um, I didn't think about that, but yeah. Yeah, he's drawn with cauliflower ear. Um but I mean, the one thing here that kind of got me, but um, was totally how he it. he surprised Batman with garbage in his face. He, he says remarkable. Garbage. It's like remarkable. Yeah. yeah, that that seems out of that seems out of left field there. Um, and on the next page, we've got uh, Batman. He, it, and this is before uh, this is before Tim Burton's Batman '89. Batman was still throwing a batarang with a line on it. Like this isn't a grappling hook. Um, so he, he gets on that and he starts swinging away and, uh, hold on while my computer loads these pages. <laughs> Technical fun. Yeah. He, he's this, throwing away this, like this book. I, it was a problem on my, it was a problem on my Xbox when I was reading it earlier. And, and it's a problem right now on my computer where I'm flipping through the pages and it keeps going back to pages that I like, like right now I'm flipping through and I've got, you have, you, you know how I hate having my time wasted. And then I go to the next page and it's the cover weird. Yeah. And, and now it's the, the page with, with the line. Well, the next page here, Superman takes his line off the gargoyle and, and is flying and is flying with him. Um, he calls him an outlaw. So um, weird. And that. then he's going to take him into the police. And Superman even makes a reference. I've been called that, too. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, yeah, you have. It's like, yeah, I don't know. It's it's one of those things where it's like I. I personally think Superman would be like, let's talk, Batman. Like, like Superman's an investigative journalist. Like, he would want to, like, sort out and try to figure out the facts. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I see that as one way, but I also think that the everything that he's investigated to this point of Batman is um, the stuff that he's found is like the violence and, you know, these the criminals who are who have been brutally attacked and probably taken into the hospital before taken to jail. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, kind of, kind of on the same lines of of um, uh, BVS. Like why why Superman is going after Batman, and in that one, obviously Batman was going down a very dark path. Which makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it def it fit it fit really well. Um, but uh, Batman drops off the line, and Superman looks thinking he's gonna fall to his death, and then he disappears. Like he doesn't know how. He disappears. Uh, how can that be in the reports of his activities? I saw no indication of superpower as a superb athlete and an intuitive genius by all accounts. But I read nothing to suggest he could fly or move at super speed or turn invisible. And then Batman standing on the building. Invisibility is a relative thing. Superman. Sometimes all it requires is wits and a matchless knowledge of the city. I mean, surprising. Yeah. Surprising. What? <laughs> It's true. Yeah. Uh, surprising Superman that he is on a building behind him. Um, and then they have uh, an interaction on uh, on the rooftop. Uh, Batman has this uh, force field um, that is activated due to Superman's presence. Uh, he calls it super dense bi- biological material. In other words, Superman, you. Yeah, it was, um, that was a really interesting just kind of thing. Yeah, uh, definitely a product of the time, you know, kind of like just just this reactive thing that happens that, you know, just, just this uh, the scientific, the super science reactive force field, you know, that only is activated when you're near. Um, but uh he uses it as um, as a tool to basically make Superman um, uh, vulnerable, not vulnerable, but the the way to beat him. So that's why Superman can't attack him. Superman can't come for him. Uh, Superman says, uh, you realize I could have you behind bars before you even know you've moved. So, you know, uh, Batman knows this um, and. I mean, didn't we didn't we actually experience this same um, this same interaction in Frank Miller's year one Basically. Um, where, yeah, where Batman says that he has placed a bomb in Gotham City and an innocent person uh, will die if Superman um, tries to take him in or tries to, to beat him or attack him. Um. But then when the next page, we've got uh, Batman telling Superman that Superman's great at um, taking, you know, he's he's great at protecting the planet, uh, at, at being a defender of the planet. But um, cleaning up a city is different than than protecting the world. And that Gotham is um, that Gotham is a city that's different than most Um, that it's hard that it, you know, it's a different beast when it comes to defending and protecting and catching these criminals. Um, and he goes into the story of how this jeweler had his, had his shop robbed, uh, of precious stones and these metal balls were left behind that were explosives and uh, that, it was pretty wild. It says the blast knocked out windows all down the street, and it took the coroner's men two days to find all the pieces of Henry Jarrell, who was the jeweler. Um, and then uh, he he describes other things that they're all different. Um, I I mean I like this approach. <laughs> Like, for the most part of the two of them first meet, I think it's always a fun story that writers want to find. 
Yeah, this this was a good interaction the first time they met. The the difference in their methods, the difference in the things that that Batman deals with as opposed to what Superman deals with. Um uh Chancellor's Diamond, um uh a poison gas bomb was left in place of the Regency Emerald, three dead. Uh Willikers rare stones and gems. Uh, a gadget that squirted acid, two dead and one horribly disfigured. Uh, Tenenbaums, antiques, and collectibles. Um, a little steel rook that fired uh, razor-edged blades. Three dead and two hospitalized. Like, I mean, it's brutal what's what's happening and and the things that he deals with. Just small things. He has to he has to do the detective work mm-hmm. to find. An hour ago, my investigation led me to a man called Bull Carter, and that's the guy he was chasing. Um, and Bull works for Magpie, um, which I had never seen. I've heard of Magpie, but I had never seen her before. The only two places I've seen her before this book was um, Gotham yep. and uh, um, Beware the Batman. And then she's in Batwoman. A version of her is, but I is remember she, that must have been part of the season. I didn't. I didn't because I, have, I haven't finished watching the entire first season of Batwoman yet. I remember the big thing of like I. She's actually one of those people I'd seen a drawing of her, and it wasn't this version. And I'd heard that she was in this story, but I had remember seeing her like because one thing Beware the Batman wanted to do, which. I, it gives me like I respect them for, but at the same time, was not a good idea. Was they wanted to bring to life all the villains that people didn't know, you know, instead of like. And I'm like, that's great, but you need some bigger hooks in there. But yeah, Magpie was supposed to be one of their key villains. In the morning. In the morning. Um, like some sugar she's magpie is very upset um she expected bull to basically send batman on a wild goose chase um she wasn't happy that bull basically um uh he, he blew it he blew the opportunity to send him on on that wild goose chase um so she's not happy and uh she she ends up scratching him with a paralysis venom and then she stuffs a stick of dynamite in his mouth and the other guy says oh no boss not happy birthday not happy birthday like she blew bull up she blew his head off it was intense with a stick of dynamite um but in the end that's what drew superman and batman to her Superman heard the explosion, hears her laughing, and then they both head over to uh, Gotham's Gotham uh, Museum of Antiquities, uh, a defunct, a derelict uh, museum, a place that's been closed for years. She's laughing. Bull's body's laying on the ground with a couple of little blood splatters. Uh, Batman shows up. They can see him on the cameras. At least one of her guys can. And Superman busts through the wall, which is awesome. <laughs> guy, t- yeah. Guy takes off running. She says, "Blast him!" Guy takes off running. Are you kidding? That guy just punched through a stone wall. <laughs> Getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and in the 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 bottom two of three panels. The bottom two of three panels, um, guys shooting at Superman. And it's kind of something you would see on Lois and Clark or Smallville. Like you'd see b- bullets bouncing off and then just like like in a blink of an eye, like a super speed where Superman grabs the gun out of the guy's hand. Yep. Like, I mean, that's that's literally something you've seen over and over again in, in Superman media. And then I love um, this. You have Batman like with the other guy. And he's like, here, Superman, great work. I've caught, here's the other one. <laughs> yeah. hey, please don't hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, you know, Magpie releases that agent 
that chemical aging. Yeah, uh, we just call it TTFN Super. Uh, sh- no, that's something else. Um, she just releases a, a gas, um, the world and world. it's an acidic gas. I mean, it's like Joker's uh, acid bomb in the first episode of Harley. Uh, uh, everything it touches is is melting away. Um, Superman can't can't save everybody because he can't touch Batman. So what does he do? He inhales all of that acid smoke. Super and, super lungs, man. Yep. And then he goes into space and blows it into space. And it's really cool how he talks about it in, in this. You wouldn't see this really today, um, in, in, especially in a thought bubble like this. But it says, in the frigid vacuum of space, guests instantly frozen into crystals of ice. And my microscopic vision shows that the freezing process has caused a chemical change. The stuff is no longer a dangerous solvent. Now, since that little stunt has also exhausted the air in my lungs, I'd better get inside Earth's atmosphere. So this is also a point here where Superman can fly in space. He's invulnerable to the cold, um, the cold and the vacuum of space, but he still requires oxygen. So he needs, you know, he needs whatever he can hold in his lungs to fly through space. I like it because it's the exposition dialogue works here because we are like in our second page of like our rebooted Superman and we kind of need to know where we are. Yeah. Well, it's like that episode of, of Lois and Clark where he, where there, there's an asteroid on collision course for earth and Superman goes to fly out to save it. He has an oxygen tank he takes with him and with the amount of oxygen it can hold and the amount of time he can hold his breath in between breaths, taking breaths of the oxygen, um, will allow him to fly out into space for hours but he still requires that oxygen to make it there. So I like it. So uh, he's afraid Superman's making a run or um, Superman's afraid that Batman is making a run for it. When Batman's here in his car, this isn't quite your Batmobile um, that you would see today. It's more like a regular car, but he has a crime lab in the trunk of his car. Um, analyzes some of the glass that uh, Magpie destroyed with that was filled with the gas and discovers a single fiber, of course, right? A single mm-hmm. fiber uh, that is 5,000 years old. Uh, ancient fiber. So, uh, of course, Batman deduces the only place that, could possibly, that it could possibly uh, originate from which is the Gotham Museum. And they f- chase, they find Magpie in the Gotham Museum. They, they show an Egyptian exhibit, um, and they discover her to be Margaret Pie. And they discuss about how she is, uh, is psychologically broken. Um, she's not a real criminal, not the kind of gutter slime I've dedicated myself to destroying. She's just a frail human psyche, an unbalanced id that got pushed too far. You saw the psychological profile in her record. A little girl who loved pretty things a trifle too much, perhaps who was taunted and called magpie because of it, who educated herself, became a curator of one of the nation's leading museums, and found herself having to watch over pretty things she could never possess. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, but Batman still, I feel sorry for her, Superman, but I feel more sorry for her victims. Even though she's psychologically broken, it doesn't excuse her actions for killing people. I like how, I like what Batman says, like, about feeling sorry for her, like, how he explains it back to Superman. Like, I liked it a lot. Yeah. It was very well. It was very well written. I, I think this whole issue is very well, well written. Um, the only line so, I don't like in this, and we're getting there, but I'll tell you here in a second. Okay. Um, well, they they're outside. They're they're across the street from the museum on the roof. The cops show up, take her in cust- into custody. Um, you know, uh, and Batman here 
this is Batman. This is this is Batman right here. His his cynical view of of the world because he knows that the system is broken. That's one of the things. That's one of the differences between Superman and Batman. Superman believes in the system and believes the system works. Batman believes in the system, but only believes in it if you can force it to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, he knows that it's broken. He knows that it works, but he also knows that it's broken. And that's the difference between the two um, to, you know, to a degree. Batman has a cynic, more of a cynical view on it. But he says if Gotham is lucky, they'll put her in and they'll put her in a nice, safe, padded cell out at Arkham Asylum. And if we're unlucky, she'll find herself a hot shot legal eagle, uh, legal eagle and be back on the streets before you're halfway home to Metropolis. And then you got Superman. You sound bitter, Batman. I guess you've got reason. Your Gotham is different from my town. It's so, true. Uh, and then we got, uh, well, Batman here saying he hasn't slept in four days. So I think Batman's kind of tired now. Needs to at least sleep once or twice a week. Uh, but Superman stops him. Uh, we still have we still have the matter of an innocent life you placed in jeopardy. And Batman says, oh, yes, the bomb. And Batman had the bomb on himself the whole time. He had a real bomb, so it made sure he wasn't lying because he also says, um, I also knew that with your great powers, you'd probably be able to tell uh, if I were lying. Yep, and that makes sense. So he didn't put an innocent life. He didn't put anybody else's life in danger but his own. Which I like. Um, but he was honestly in danger. So, you know, it, it, he wasn't lying. But to make but but to make it effective, Superman had to believe it was somebody else and not him. I just so the line that I don't like is the last line. A remarkable man, all things considered, who knows? In a different reality, I might have called him friend. Like, that's a weird way. Like, why can't they just eventually be friends? Why, you know, like, it's just a weird way of like, right. uh, maybe we've been friends someday. Well, I like, almost wonder if that wasn't like, see, I don't know much about anything before crisis. You know how I'm not much of a Silver Age reader at this point. I haven't gone back that far yet. Um, I almost wonder if this wasn't like a um, uh, kind of like a callback, like. I'm sure World's Finest was out before in the Silver Age, right? When yeah. they were okay, so there were probably times where they were friends before in in a you know quote unquote another reality. Um, so I think that this is kind of just like a callback to to that. Like this is their first meeting. This is a darker, more confrontational Batman. Um, this is a different Superman than there was before. So I think that's more or less kind of what it is. It seems it does kind of stand out, I think, but just upon review and, and this being the Superman, right? This is the Superman immediately after crisis. This is the beginning. This is their first meeting. So that's, that's just, that's what I take from it. It makes sense. It would be cool. But yeah, I, I enjoyed issue three. Um, it, it This one, okay, so with the three that we've read so far, if I had to order them by favorite to least favorite, it would go two, three, one. I probably say the same. Um, and two and three aren't really, and two and three are not, they're almost indistinguishable from one or two. I mean, on any day, it could probably be one or the other, you know? My, my, um, my, it's, it's, my reasoning behind it is we already know how I feel about issue one, so I don't have to go into all that. But my thing is two felt more organic where it starts. This one still feels weird, like all of a sudden, like Superman's just decided to hunt down Batman. Right, yeah, there is no lead-in to it. That's true. 
Um, there is no buildup that we get, say, in like BVS. You know, there's no buildup before he, before he, um, comes before he confronts Batman. So that's just kind of my like, ah, uh, like he just shows up and like. So I mean, it works, but that valid reason, valid reason, definitely, um, <clears throat> uh, for sure, yeah, uh, valid reason. Um, I, I like I said, I think on any day here, it could be, um, it could be two or three. You know, it was a three was a very good story. It, it just like it's, like you said, it just happened, but three was a very good story. Um, I, I think their their first meeting was was really good. Um, I don't know if there's anything that goes on between the books. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if Superman's running congruent. I need to do some reading, but like, I don't know if, is Superman running congruent with this. So like, you're reading the Man of Steel miniseries, which is like the high points, but we also have other things going on in the actual Superman book. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I you know, yeah, I I don't know. To me, yeah, I, I really don't. Um, but uh it was it was very good um i don't have any complaints it, other than just like no that. no i i i'm enjoying it i'm enjoying uh book 1 is definitely my least favorite out of the 3 that we've read so far which is so but, weird but uh, i'm enjoying us. the whole yeah <laughs> I, I i liked it but it's just my least favorite um but yeah it's it's a good uh, it's a good series. I'm glad we're I'm glad we're reading it. So, all right. Anything else you want to throw in there and add, James? You can think of. Uh, no, no. Um, looking forward to reading book four. Got Lex Luthor on the cover there, and where else can we go but to Luthor? Yeah, of course. So jumping back to our recent dive into legion i'm actually enjoying it a lot more than i thought i would just like i don't know it's kind of neat because it's like it's new to me but it's an older cartoon and it still has that older cartoon flair and flavor that i miss so episode two i watched with the kids and it was really it was good like the heart like i had seen it before but i kind of forgotten it um timberwolf is the episode and we learn that this scientist calls the Legion for help. And the reason why he needs help is because there's this beast that's out of control on his island. And the Legion Saturn girl encounters it. And we find out that the beast is actually the scientist's son. He's just in a very heightened, enraged state. And the scientist wants the Legion basically to bring him in so that he can continue experimenting on him. I thought that was like a really big, it's a big deal, you know, Uh, just the contrast of what this person's willing to put their son through. Um, Yeah, this, the scientist in this episode, I mean, he he was a piece of garbage. Um, He's performing illegal genetic experiments he's he's outside of um uh other he's outside of uh different galactic jurisdictions um i mean it is the future but at the same time i'm like uh doesn't the green lantern Corps basically have like the entire galaxy universe as their um right i mean they do have different things i mean like i don't know like the ghost sector or, you know, like they probably have certain areas that are probably like just outside of like the green lantern sectors. You know what I mean? Maybe some unexplored areas or something. Yeah. Or, or that makes sense. You know, kind of like the outer rim, what have you. <laughs> yeah. This ain't star Wars, man. The outer rim. <laughs> um, well, like uh, in the Green Lantern core, uh, in the Green Lantern animated series, like they went, what they do, go beyond uh, an asteroid wall or something. And it was like out of the Guardian's jurisdiction or something. So weird. So, I mean, 
Yeah. I mean, Guardians of the Universe, they have most corners, you know, policed, but I'm guessing not every corner. Uh, but yeah, yeah, he's he's performing illegal, illegal genetic experiments. Um, he's voiced by Harry Lennox. Um, Harry Lennox? Henry? Yep. Harry, right? Um, and, uh, which is really cool. I mean, it's legacy right there in DC. <laughs> this is and, before uh, he was, uh, in Man of Steel. Yeah. Yeah. So, and like Man of Steel was like his legacy cast. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, he's just, he's a trash person and he's, he did these experiments, uh, on his own son, as well as who knows, who knows who and what else. And, uh, his son very upset about the whole thing, uh, rightfully so. And he destroys his lab. Um, and he leaves the planet and goes off to join the Legion as Timberwolf. Timberwolf isn't there, but he's brought up. Take it away. That's what James said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They do reference Timberwolf uh, like. Like uh, the during his, yeah, something about his, it was supposed to be his, uh, Superman and Timberwolf's, um, uh, uh patrol. Yeah. Uh, patrol shift or something. I almost want to say but, fight. But, uh, yeah, in this episode, uh, we, Superman rescues a young woman named Alexis. Um, and she, richest girl in the galaxy. Yeah. The smartest all her time with him. And she goes so far to even try to destroy the Legion just so Superman has the time to be with her. She even helps the people that the Legion are trying to stop. And yeah, she upgrades them. She even starts, you know, her own thing. And, this one kind of threw me for a second because I wasn't really thinking and I wasn't really paying attention like as I should. But, you know, Alexis and she has red hair and then she gets in a fight and goes bald. And then, yeah. and then uh, it dawns on me with when they show like her symbol, which is like a square, but it's like two L's. And I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> Same thing. I, I it did not strike me at all the entire episode. Everything she's doing, being smart, being rich, wanting to be with Superman, this it never even struck me until uh, you know, you saw Superman see the symbol and I was like, huh. I saw the symbol and I was like, is that is that L L like upside down making a rectangle? And then uh and then it, it it fully hit me when the explosion happened and Superman saved her from the explosion, but all of her hair fell out and she was bald. I was like, oh, my God, Alexis Lex. I was like, she's like the future Lex. She's like the future Lex counterpart. And I didn't think about it just because I'm like, this is the future and they're not like trying to. Like, it's not like it's a new series or a spinoff or like something like that. It was I'm not even thinking so, yeah, I thought um, I thought she was going to stay bald. Um, but then the very next scene, her hair, her red hair is starting to grow back. And yes, she has red hair like Lex Luthor has, is portrayed most of the time with. I enjoyed it. I'm digging this. You know, the kids were upset because I started this episode and they weren't around to watch it. They want to watch it with me. So that's. Been one Looks of like things. you're going to have to watch three episodes next time. You're going to have to watch this episode so the kids can see it, and then the next two. <laughs> oh, oh, darn. Oh, what, what punishment is this? Having to watch such a awesome Superman cartoon. Just like today, my beautiful, amazing daughter was like, Daddy, let's watch Smallville. What? Was that That's true? awesome. Because <laughs> I, I pulled it up because... Uh, I noticed that uh, the Smallville pilot on Hulu, because I was trying to find that scene that I'm just laughing about, where Lex or the school bus, one of them, I was screenshot running to camp. wasn't there either. Mm -hmm. they, they added in extra, they added in extra footage that they cut out for commercials and for time constraints. 
Um, so the DVDs have footage and jokes and things that you've never seen. What them from the DVD? Have price books and try to find all these DVDs. I used to Let's have find se- all the friends I DVDs. Have, yes, <laughs> I have season ten on DVD um, because at the time my roommate had all the others, but not season ten. So I bought that one because I was like, you know, we're roommating and sharing. Look up in the sky. Look up in the sky. Look in the sky. 